among whom there were those who thought that to live temperately and avoid all excess would count for much, as a preservative against seizures of this kind. Wherefore they banded together, and dissociating themselves from all others, formed communities in houses where there were no sick, and lived a separate and secluded life, which they regulated with the utmost care, avoiding every kind of luxury, but eating and drinking very moderately of the most delicate wines and the finest wines, holding converse with none but one another, lest tidings of sickness or death should reach them, and diverting their minds with music and such other delights as they could devise. Other, the bias of whose minds was in the opposite direction, maintained that to drink freely, frequent places of public resort, and take their pleasure with song and revel, sparing to satisfy no appetite, and to laugh and mock at no event, was the sovereign remedy for so great an evil, and that which they affirmed they also put in practice, so far as they were able, resorting day and night, now to this tavern, now to that, drinking with an entire disregard of rule or measure, and by preference making the houses of others, as it were, their ends, if they but saw in them aught that was particularly to their taste or liking, which they were readily able to do, because the owners, seeing death imminent, had become a reckless of their property as of their lives, so that most of the houses were open to all comers, and no distinction was observed between the stranger who presented himself and the rightful lord. Thus, adhering even to their inhuman determination to shun the sick, as far as possible, they ordered their life, in this extremity of our city's suffering and tribulation, the venerable authority of laws, human and divine, was abased and all but totally dissolved, for lack of those who should have administered and enforced them, most of whom, like the rest of the citizens, were either dead or sick, or so hard bested by servants that they were unable to execute any office, whereby every man was free to do what was right in his own eyes. Not a few there were who belonged to neither of the two said parties, but kept a middle course between them, neither laying the same restraint upon their diet as the former, nor allowing themselves the same license in drinking and other dissipations as the latter, but living with a degree of freedom sufficient to satisfy their appetites, and not as recluses. They therefore walked abroad, carrying in their hands flowers of fragrant herbs, or diverse sorts of spices, which they frequently raised to their noses, deeming it an excellent thing thus to comfort the brain with such perfumes, because the air seemed to be everywhere laden and reeking with the stench emitted by the dead and the dying, and the odours of drugs. Some again, the most sound perhaps in judgment, as they were also the most harsh in temper of all, affirmed that there was no medicine for the disease, superior or equal in efficiency, to flight, following which prescription a multitude of men and women, negligent of all but themselves, deserted their city, their houses, their estates, their kinsfolk, their goods, and went into voluntary exile, or migrated to the country parts, as if God, in visiting men with this pestilence, in requital of their iniquities, would not pursue them with his wrath wherever they might be, but intended the destruction of such alone as remained within the circuit of the walls of the city, or deeming perchance that it was now time for all to flee from it, and that its last hour was come. Of the adherents of these diverse opinions, not all died, neither did all escape, but rather there were, of each sort and in every place, many that second, and by those who retained their health were treated after the example which they themselves, while whole, had set, being everywhere left to languish in almost total neglect. Tedious were it to recount how to citizen avoided citizen, how among neighbors was scarce found any that shewed fellow feeling for another, how kinsfolk held aloof and never met, or but rarely, enough that this sore affliction entered so deep into the minds of men and women, that in the horror thereof, brother was forsaken by brother, nephew by uncle, brother by sister, and oftentimes husband by wife, nay, what is more, and scarcely to be believed, 
fathers and mothers were found to abandon their own children, untended and visited to their fate, as if they had been strangers. Wherefore the sick of both sexes, whose number could not be estimated, were left without resource but in the charity of friends, and few such there were, or in the interest of servants, who were hardly to be had, at high rates and on unseemly terms, and being moreover one and all, men and women of gross understanding, and for the most part unused to such offices, concerned themselves no further than to supply the immediate and expressed wants of the sick, and to watch them die, in which service they themselves not seldom perished with their gains. In consequence of which dearth, of servants and dereliction of the sick by neighbors, kinsfolk and friends, it came to pass, a thing perhaps never before heard of, that no woman, however dainty, fair or well, born she might be, shrank, when stricken with the disease, from the ministrations of a man, no matter whether he were young or no, or scrupled to expose to him every part of her body, with no more shame than if he had been a woman, submitting of necessity to that which her malady required, wherefrom perchance there resulted in after time some loss of modesty in such as recovered. Besides which many succumbed, who with proper attendance would perhaps have escaped death, so that, what with the virulence of the plague and the lack of due tendance of the sick, the multitude of the deaths that daily and nightly took place in the city, was such that those who heard the tale, not to say witnessed the fact, were struck dumb with amazement, whereby, Practices contrary to the former habits of the citizens could hardly fail to grow up among the survivors. It had been, as today it still is, the custom for the women that were neighbors and of kin to the deceased, to gather in his house with the women that were most closely connected with him, to wail with them in common, while on the other hand his male kinsfolk and neighbors was not a few of the other citizens, and the due proportion of the clergy according to his quality, assembled without, in front of the house, to receive the corpse. And so the dead man was borne on the shoulders of his peers, with funeral pomp of taper and dirge, to the church selected by him before his death. Which rites, at the pestilence waxed in fury, were either in whole or in great part disused, and gave way to others of a novel order. For not only did no crowd of women surround the bed of the dying, but many passed from this life unregarded, and few indeed were they to whom were accorded the lamentations and bitter tears of sorrowing relations. Nay, for the most part, their place was taken by the laugh, the jest, the festal gathering. Observances which the woman, domestic piety in large measure set aside, had adopted with very great advantage to their health. Few also there were whose bodies were attended to the church by more than ten or twelve of their neighbors and those not the honorable and respected citizens, but a sort of corpse-carriers, drawn from the baser ranks, who called themselves Becini, and performed such offices for hire, would shoulder the bier, and with hurried steps carry it, not to the church of the dead man's choice, but to that which was nearest at hand, with four or six priests in front, and a candle or two, or perhaps none, nor did the priests distress themselves with too long or solemn an office, but with the aid of the Piccini hastily consigned the corpse to the first tomb which they found untenanted. The condition of the lower, and perhaps in great measure of the middle ranks, of the people showed even worse and more deplorable, for, deluded by hope or constrained by poverty, they stayed in their quarters, in their houses, where they sickened by thousands a day, and being without service or help of any kind, were, so to speak, irredeemably devoted to the death which overtook them. Many died daily or nightly in the public streets. Of many others who died at home, the departure was hardly observed by their neighbors, until the stench of their putrefying bodies carried the tidings. And what with their corpses and the corpses of others who died on every hand, the whole place was a sepulchre. It was the common practice of most of the neighbors, moved no less by fear of contamination, by the putrefying bodies, than by charity towards the deceased, to drag the corpses out of the houses with their own hands, aided perhaps by a porter, if a porter was to be had, and to lay them in front of the doors, where any one who made the round might have seen, 
especially in the morning, more of them than he could count. Afterward they would have beers brought up, or in default planks, whereupon they laid them. Nor was it once or twice only that one and the same beer carried two or three corpses at once. But quite a considerable number of such cases occurred, one beer sufficing for husband and wife, two or three brothers, father and son, and so forth. And times without number it happened, that, as two priests, bearing the cross, were on their way to perform the last office for some one, three or four beers were brought up by the porters in rear of them, so that, whereas the priests supposed that they had but one corpse to bury, they discovered that there were six or eight, or sometimes more. Nor, for all their number, were their obsequies honoured by either tears or lights or crowds of mourners. Rather it was come to this, that a dead man was then of no more account than a dead goat would be to-day. From all which it is abundantly manifest, that that lesson of patient resignation, which the sages were never able to learn from the slight and infrequent mishaps which occur in the natural course of events, was now brought home even to the minds of the simple, by the magnitude of their disasters, so that they became indifferent to them. As consecrated ground there was not in extent sufficient to provide tombs for the vast multitude of corpses, which day and night, and almost every hour, were brought in eager haste to the churches for interment, least of all, if ancient custom were to be observed, and a separate resting place assigned to each. They dug for each graveyard, as soon as it was full, a huge trench, in which they laid the corpses, as they arrived by hundreds at a time, pilling them up as merchandise is stowed in the hold of a ship, tier upon tier, each covered with a little earth, until the trench could hold no more. But I spare to rehearse with minute particularity each of the woes that came upon our city, and say in brief, that, harsh as was the tenor of her fortunes, the surrounding country knew no mitigation, for there, not to speak of the castles, each, as it were, a little city in itself, in sequestered village, or on the open champaign, by the wayside, on the farm, in the homestead, the poor hapless husbandsmen and their families, forlorn of physician's care or servant's tendance, perish day and night alike, not as men, but rather as beasts. Wherefore they too, like the citizens, abandoned all rule of life, all habit of industry, all counsel of prudence, nay, one and all, as if expecting each day to be their last, not merely ceased to aid nature to yield her fruit in due season, of their beasts and their lands and their past labours, but left no means unused, which ingenuity could devise, to waste their accumulated store, denying shelter to their oxen, asses, sheep, goats, pigs, foals, nay, even to their dogs, man's most faithful companions, and driving them out into the fields, to roam at large, amid the unsheathed, nay, and reaped corn. Many of which, as if endowed with reason, took their fill during the day, and returned home at night, without any guidance of herdsmen. But enough of the country. What need we add, but, reverting to the city, that such and so grievous was the harshness of heaven, and perhaps in some degree of man, that, what with the fury of the pestilence, the panic of those whom it spared, and their consequent neglect or desertion of not a few of the stricken in their need, it is believed without any manner of doubt that between March and the ensuing July upwards of a hundred thousand human beings lost their lives within the walls of the city of Florence, which before the deadly visitation would not have been supposed to contain so many people. How many grand palaces, how many stately homes, how many splendid residences, once full of retainers, of lords, of ladies, were now left desolate of all, even to the meanest servant. How many families of historic fame, of vast ancestral domains, and wealth proverbial, found now no scheme to continue the succession. Now many brave men, how many fair ladies, how many gallant youths, whom any physician, where he gallant Hippocrates or Asculapius himself, would have pronounced in the soundest of health, broke fast with their kinsfolk, comrades, and friends in the morning, and when evening came, supped with their forefathers in the other world. 